So I guess we can commence. A very small and secluded crowd. <laughs> so please let me know if you ask questions along the way, since we're not any more people here. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to tell you my background. I know you've been able to read about it, but it's kind of important for me to underline that I am, at first was a teacher for many years, and also an educational psychologist. Um, in between the two, I did my PhD in my primary research field, which is inclusion. But when I finished that, I really wanted to go back to practice. So I went back and worked as an educational psychologist in a community outside of Copenhagen and really enjoyed it and liked being out in practice, but was asked to go back to the university and be head of a systematic review on inclusion. I couldn't say no to that because this is really my passionate field, inclusion. So I went back and uh, I got stuck at the Danish Clearinghouse for educational research. I am an assistant professor at the uh, University of Aarhus in Copenhagen, which in itself is very strange since Aarhus is in Jutland, but I am in Copenhagen. Um, and I'm now the head of the Danish Clearinghouse, at least until now, because I still like working where the children are and where the professionals are. But the reason I actually chose to stay is I think it's really important to give research back to practitioners. The institute where Clearinghouse is placed is the largest educational research institute in Denmark. And I can say that about 90% of the research that's going on there is theoretical and not really necessarily getting back to practice. And this is something that is really in my heart to give back because why are we doing educational research? It must be for teachers, for school leaders, for municipalities, for the ministries, etc. So this is just to give you my background. But um, if we look, I'm sorry, I don't have my shift thing. Um, <laughs> but if we look at the Danish and using evidence in a Danish educational context, um, we have up to 2005 been talking about evaluation. So it's a very new thing for us. In 2006, we started talking about what actually works. And we needed to have some more we started talking about effectiveness and about value for money interventions. In 2006, we were established the Danish Clearinghouse for Educational Research. And one of the reasons for this was an OECD report on the Danish educational system where we were not doing quite well and also where it was quite clear that quantitative research was really unrepresented in Denmark. And I can also say that this is quite similar, I think, also for both Sweden and Norway. Norway established their clearinghouse, similar to ours, in 2014. And in Sweden, they started this year, working on a clearinghouse also. So in 2009, we did our first RCT, randomized control trial, uh, in the educational area in Denmark, which was actually in the daycare area. Then in 2010 to 2016, a new center was established, the Center for Strategical Educational Research, which goal was to promote uh, randomized control trials and also natural experiments. One of these <laughs> uh, was the ELI, which was an effect, which was a randomized control trial on the effect of in-service education. This was a very interesting randomized control trial because there were two groups. There was an experimental group who were actually taught about how to do classroom management, and the control group had um, about how to use uh, ICT in the classrooms. The interesting thing was that the intervention was actually made up from the teacher education society, or uh, uh, colleges, and uh, it actually had no effect. So this was interesting because this is some of the knowledge we also can gain in saying, what is actually working and why isn't it working? Why didn't it work on these teachers? The second RCT in Denmark was the Opus. I don't know how many of you know that we have the world's best restaurant in Denmark called Noma, which is a very popular restaurant <laughs> where we are, amongst other things, known for eating ants. You have to be very quick when you eat in there. <laughs> But we did a school trial, 100 million crowns was put into this project, 800 children participated, 
And it was a crossover trial where we had children eating Nordic diet, uh, Nordic food for three months, the other half not eating, and then they crossed over. And there were a lot of things involved in this. This was very exciting. I was a part of this project because they had blood tested or scanned. They were whatever. A lot of things I knew absolutely nothing about. I was actually a supervisor on a PhD project about NPUFA 3. Don't ask me what it is, uh, but it had an effect. But I was working with the effects of how is this diet actually working on, are the children being better performers in reading, maths, and also in concentration. The sad part of this was, again, it didn't work. <laughs> they did not get better in any of the three areas. But on the other hand, they became allergic to nuts. They gained in weight. <laughs> but the research, and I have to say, you cannot quote me on this because I will not be popular. Again, it was a very expensive project. But the interesting thing is the researchers said that was because the children liked the food so much, so they ate more than they usually did. I don't know how serious this result is, but that was the explanation. But the point being, it's an interesting thing when you start these things that you actually get a documentation of what you think might be right isn't. And what logically we might say, of course this works, it actually doesn't. This is just to give you a picture of, this is from the review I mentioned early on inclusion. And you can see the designs, how they're divided between the United States, Europe, and other countries. And you can see that in the United States is still there where the experimental studies, where most of them are being done now. So if we look at what we're doing um, at the Danish Clearinghouse uh, for Educational Research, we are a center that gathers, categorizes, assesses, analyzes, synthesizes and distributes empirical research within the area of education. Um, so what we do is we're doing meta-analysis where we're collecting what other people have done and looking at what has worked or what hasn't worked for others. And in this way, we are a center that can gather a lot of knowledge for teachers very quickly to get a picture of what is actually going on within educational research. I can say now that we are a center. As I said, we're placed at the university. But I have to um, obtain all my own financing. And a lot of people say, well, who are the primary? Who are the ones who are actually shopping at Clearinghouse? And I can say mainly it's the ministry. And then teachers look at me and say, well, then you're not producing um, objective results because you're doing what the ministry wants. What is interesting about systematic reviews and mappings is we never know. So you might want a systematic review on inclusion. You're not going to know what the results are because we don't know what the research has to show us before, before we found it. And as I said, of course, when you look at the Opus, the Nordic Meal Study, the goal was definitely not that the children were supposed to gain weight or become allergic. They were supposed to be more healthy and better learners. <coughs> So how do we actually do this? We started the clearinghouse. We worked on basis of the epicenter from London, um, where they also do systematic research mappings. And we have, in many ways, been inspired by them. But what we do is we apply a both rigid, broad, and systematic search strategy in order to gather as much relevant research as possible. So what we're doing is asking a question to the research and finding the accessible research that's out there. And then again, it's very important to say we are not finding it all, but we are finding what we're asking to find. So it's a specific question we're putting. We then screen them, and we're using the EPI Review of Four software to make sure that it's very systematic what we're doing. So we're sure that what we're looking for, what we're asking for, we're actually bringing it up um, to see it. And finally, we do a narrative synthesis. And there's a point in why we always do a narrative synthesis. Because if you look at Hattie or you look at a David Mitchell, um, when they do their meta-analysis, they're only looking at hardcore randomized control trials. We don't do that in Clearinghouse because we think there's a lot of qualitative research out there that's very important also to bring into our reviews. 
And of course, also, we are part of the Nordic countries, and we're interested also to looking at Nordic research. So if we only looked at experimental studies, we would not have a lot of Nordic research there at all. So sometimes we do that, we have two research questions. So we might look at very specific designs in the international, well, Nordic is also international, we usually call it that, but we might have specific designs for the international part and a bit broader questions for the Nordic studies. So this is to give you a picture of how we work. And um, if you look at the top, we have the question. It could be what interventions are effective uh, in including children in regular schools, uh, children with special needs. We then do a search pro uh, process in the biggest uh, databases. ERIC is one of them. We do a lot of searches in, psych info, pro, um, web of science, et cetera. When we've done this, we look at the search terms. And one of the interesting projects, for example, we're doing now is about um, how we implement research in practice. And there's actually very little research in this area. And it's a dawning field. Um, but we look at what are the researchers actually themselves saying. And these are one of our really big, uh, one of the biggest hinders we have is that researchers are actually really not very good at writing what their research is actually about or the keywords they're using. So you might have some excellent research on inclusion, but actually when they're putting them into the databases, the word might not even be mentioned, which means that we don't find it. So when we've done this, we always have a reference group working for us consisting of international experts, researchers in the field, who look at it and say, have we found what we should? Have we overlooked something? We also do references from references, taking references from other systematic reviews or other research. Finally, we then have the references, and then we start the screening and rescoping phase. When working with systematic reviews, we usually have about 10,000 hits. So we have 10,000 research projects lying in front of us. And we start screening them to say, are they actually answering the question we're asking? And if we can see, yes, we have quite a lot that are, then we might do what's called a rescoping. Because in order to do a proper synthesis, you have to have an accessible amount of research. And usually that means about 70 to 100 studies. When we have the studies we want, we do a quality assessment. So, and I'll show you in a little bit what that contains, but we look at is this research of a proper quality? Can we actually say this is showing us something? Or is it of a quality that's so poor that it's not okay to bring back to practice? And then, of course, also the relevance. Then we do a weight of assessment, where we again look at what is the quality of this research. This could be a small sample size, or it could be that conclusions are made which are not, we cannot see in the data that this is a possible conclusion. So transparency is a very important thing. What have people actually been doing? Then when that is, we do abstracts on the studies. And this is something we're working a lot on. And one of the things that is very difficult also is that a lot of the things, and I will give you some examples, is we're working with the interventions that work and making sure that the abstracts we write are directed at teachers or policy, whichever we're doing it for but that they can actually access the studies and say, we can actually be inspired by this and use it. And finally, we do a thematic synthesis, saying what are the overall new research things we can pull out of these studies and say, now we have a meta perspective on what can we actually learn from this. Does it make sense? <laughs> OK. But what is really important for me and what I hear a lot is, this isn't possible because a teacher is a teacher and a class is a class and a student is a student. And again, I will be back to that again. And you cannot just say A plus B plus C equals D. If we do A and B, then we'll get C. That's not possible. For many reasons, it's not possible. But that is not our goal at all. Our goal is to make a toolbox for inspiration. What can we learn? It's about knowledge about what has worked for others. What can we learn from others who have actually succeeded in using these interventions, and how can we be inspired by them? 
And also, very important, is what hasn't worked for others. And why hasn't it worked, and how can we learn from this? Knowledge that can be used across different professions and different professionals. Again, also saying we have a new school reform in Denmark where it's very new that we have teaching assistants there and saying how can we actually use this knowledge in optimizing our collaboration. And finally, also knowledge that can be used at different levels. Many of our reviews are actually pointed both at a policy level but also at a practitioner's level. Um, so it's very different, but also the knowledge on, I can give you an example. We finished this spring, last spring, a systematic review on multilingualism. So if I ask you, early language teaching, is that a good idea? How many of you think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. F for me, it's logic. If you want to be a really good English teacher, start in the first grade, get a lot of good English teaching, and for the longer time you have it, the better a speaker you are. It's logical, right? Is the evidence there for it? Not really. And this was really a problem because in Switzerland, they're having a big debate about they have, uh, they're starting their second language in the third grade. The problem being is that they have opened the doors to saying, OK, English can be the second language. Now, the French-speaking population are not very happy about that because they think that the second language should be a national language. So we were commissioned to look at what does the research actually show. And I was about to say regretfully, it doesn't show anything <laughs> in that direction. Because the research in this area is very specific. So it's a lot about phonomics and syntaxes and et cetera. But looking exactly at longitudinal studies, for example, and saying how are the children actually doing, that research isn't there yet. So this is one of the things we also can use us for in saying, is the research there and what is actually going on? So in Denmark now, we're trying. We have a new school reform where <coughs> children are starting English uh, classes in the first grade. And now we're doing a longitudinal study to say, how is this actually going to impact their English? So what do we mean by evidence? Let's look at it. Treatment fidelity. OK, we have to look at the interventions that we're actually using that we're implementing them correct. We have to make sure that the behavioral outcomes are clearly described. What is it we want to do with this intervention, and does it work, and have the researchers actually describe what their goals are. We have to look at learner characteristics. Are they clearly described who? Or, or which children, which group of children are these interventions actually directed at? We have to make sure that the variables are controlled. So if the researchers want to look at student outcome, are they actually doing that? Are they making sure? We have to look at acceptable side effects. It may be that this intervention may do something to something else, but can we accept it? Is there a sound theory underlying the intervention? Can we look at other research uh, projects who have actually done the same? Is, is this something that is OK? Are they building on a thorough theory? Has there been a follow-up? Has the research been carried out in natural conditions? It might be a very good thing saying that eating in a restaurant every day is very good for children, but this is not a possibility in the regular schools. Have the results been published by peer-reviewed journals? I can tell you, as a researcher who does nothing else than read peer-reviewed journals, or a lot of them, that is not necessarily quality. Um, <laughs> has the research been replicated? Have, is it possible to do again? Is the intervention cost effective? Again, are the goals we're getting here, are they worth investing in, or are the results so small that it's too expensive and not worth doing? And finally, can we find the research? So how many teachers have time to do this? And is this at all possible for one teacher to do? Not really. So these are some of the things we're looking at uh, in Clearinghouse when we're assessing the, the studies. But this is evidence-based teaching. And this is a lot of what also Hattie and, and Mitchell are talking about, who I am, by the way, great fans of. But in Clearinghouse, we're really working with evidence-informed teaching. Because I do believe that a teacher is a teacher. And I do believe that classes are different. And I also do believe that there are a lot of things in 
we're playing on when we're teaching. So what we're working about is that there are a lot of things playing into an evidence-informed teaching. Knowledge about students and parents. We know our classes, we know our parents, we know uh, what they expect and how they're working together. Teaching experience. Of course, is the difference of being a new teacher or a teacher with 10 years of experience. And then we also have the not so fun part, but which is also, of course, a part of teaching. Economy, the financing, the law also, which we have to follow, and also the decisions that are made at schools. We have the school organization and culture. We know the schools are very different. Head teachers are very different. What is valued in the different schools. And then we, of course, have one of the things I think is very important, evidence from systematic research mappings and uh, reviews in the field of education. This is where the research comes in. And finally, we also have the available resources, materials, ICT, staff, et cetera. So all these things are working when we're working in a classroom as a teacher and we're teaching our students. But the important part is also saying the research. How do we actually get it accessible? This is one of the things I would love your answer to because we're working a lot with it in Clearinghouse. Um, <laughs> when we do our mappings, we al always do a smaller publication directed at teachers or policymakers who it may be we're working for. But how do we get them to actually take it up and use them? Um, this is a very difficult thing. But what is important for me to say is that we do not, and I may have blonde hair, but I'm not that naive that I think that it's just a question of giving it back to teachers. It's also a question of saying, how do we make it accessible? The review I was telling you about that we're working on right now also consists of a state of the field where we have 10 countries we've interviewed and saying, how are you working with research in, for example, teacher education? And very few countries have a systematic approach to this and are actually considering it in teacher education. And also a collaboration with universities and teacher education facilities, but also the schools. And actually the only country where we've seen an established um, cooperation is in Ontario, which is very interesting where the university has a portal where the teachers can write in and say, I need knowledge about. Where can I find the research that says? And then they find a researcher who actually is an expert in the field who answers the questions and also shows where can I find more research about this. See, that's interesting because it's very difficult. And if you look at a database like ERIC, in the 60s, there were about 50,000 studies there referenced lying in there. Today, there are 2 million. Now, how many teachers have time to look at 2 million studies and also assess if these studies are actually worth looking at at all? So, this is an example from uh, David Mitchell's book, What Really Works in Special and Inclusive Education. He has one here, cooperative group teaching, help learners learn from each other. So, this is about learners working together in small groups helping each other to carry out individual and group tasks. And he talks about both working with groups where they're at the same level academically or mixing them. And the teacher's roles here are to make sure that they have proper group tasks. This is one of the big things that happens in Denmark. I don't know if you know about teachers saying, now there's group work, you can go out into the hallway. Have you seen those? A lot of that group work really doesn't go down very well. But it's very, very, very entertaining being out in the hall. So, and also to teach group process skills. And this is one of the important things. I don't know how many of you heard uh, David Didow, but I think it's really important saying that we also have to teach the children when you ask, is peer tutoring or peer evaluation a good thing? I think it is a good thing. But they have to learn how to do it. And they have to have some tools to say, how do we actually work together or give response? How do we deal with the problems? And finally, if we look at Hattie, and I'm sure all of you know Hattie, and he says everything beneath 0.4 is not worth working with because it's either too ex expensive or not uh, effective enough. So this is a very uh, an effective intervention. But let's look at... Uh, where can we find evidence? And this is where I come into the picture, among other things. And Sweden is on its way. 
And what have we worked with? We've worked with school readiness. And this was also a very provocative um, review we did because, again, we had a state of the field. We compared 10 countries here, and then we looked at the research. And in Denmark, we have not had a very systematic approach to actually children starting school. So from daycare institution to daycare institution, it was actually up to the professionals there to figure out how they wanted to work with this. So we had the Nordic countries here, and over here we had the United States where they were doing testing and following the children, et cetera. We have our inclusion review. We have Scandinavian daycare. We have from 2006 been following all Nordic, um, or Scandinavian, sorry, research in the daycare area upper secondary education, the new Danish school reform. We have intensive courses. This is a very popular thing in Denmark right now. Uh, we are looking at in the eighth grade where teachers have to evaluate if their students are prepared to carry on to upper secondary education. And I think at this point, 26% of the students are claimed not to be, which is, of course, not very lucky in the eighth grade. So now we're talking about intensive courses similar to American courses with summer schools and uh, summer day camps. And multilingualism. So this is just to give you a picture of how broad our reviews are, and it's very different what we work with. Now, to give you a picture of what we actually gain from these, if you look at the systematic review on inclusion, we had two main categories. So we had a theme looking at um, initiatives targeting schools, and initiatives targeting pupils. And also to give you a picture of what kind of research were we actually looking at, we were looking at extensive and comprehensive meta analysis. So we had a lot of RCTs and a lot of effect studies, but we also had a lot smaller and more limited studies. And this is always a balance for us when we're looking at qualitative research. When is it done enough to we can say that this is actually something that um, people can work on and we can say in some way we can talk about generalizability. <laughs> so if we look at the um, initiatives targeting the school, we had our first theme was inclusive mainstream school um, compared to special needs class in school. And I'd like to mention an example here because these are one of the interesting things we can gain from doing these kind of uh, uh, reviews. So these studies we had here were very interesting because they were large-scale comparative studies. So we were looking at groups of people who had similar difficulties, but some were in a main school setting and some were in a special school setting. Now the interesting thing is that when we looked at the first graders, first, second, and third graders, they were doing really well. And why was that? What's important in the first and second grade? You're good at football. It's fun playing with you. You're an excellent friend. We really like you. And then we can see in the third grade something starts happening. That that's when it starts to become also a problem for the students, but also for the teachers to find out how can I include this child? Because what, what happens in the third grade? You need to be able to read. You have history. You need to read. You need to have your basic mathematical skills. So this was interesting. But the next point was then, OK, some of these children, they went back to special education settings. And what happened there? Their confidence did rise. We can see that in the studies. They did because they weren't always standing on tiptoes and not always being able to follow uh, the regular teaching. But what we could also see in the studies was that the children who were included in mainstream schools had a higher academic achievement. So the others weren't following, actually. And this is interesting, because I have, as an educational psychologist, sat, sat for I don't know how many times with teachers telling me, Camilla, this child should go to a special education setting. It's much better for them, because they have a larger confidence. It's a smaller environment. This would be better for their academic achievement. That is not necessarily so. so this is an interesting result because it shows us, again, the world is not black and white, and we need to work with different perspectives. So I'm not saying that these children shouldn't go to special education, but I'm saying that it's not either either. Um, yeah. We have the shared values, one of the things. Common goals, what are we working with, and how are we working with it? 
pedagogical approaches to inclusion in mainstream schools. One of the really interesting findings here, again, having been an educational psychologist, I have sat through several meetings about children who had some kind of dif <coughs> difficulty. It could be behavioral or academic. So a teacher comes and is worried. So I call for a meeting, right? And the psychologist comes, the parents come, the teachers come, everyone comes. And what do we do? We discuss it and we say, what is a good intervention for this child? And we set up the goals and we say, okay, in a month or two, we're going to have a new meeting and we're going to evaluate, has it worked? Sometimes it did, I have to say, but other times it didn't. But who wasn't there? The student. And who knows better than the student himself that why are you acting like this in my Danish class? The student himself would do that. And I've never done it, and it really annoyed me because I actually consider myself a quite a good psychologist, but even the most logical thing I hadn't thought. So this was also a knowledge gain. We have collaborative teaching and teaching assistants. So these were the overall there. Let me see the time. Okay, so we also have uh, interventions targeting pupils. Peer tutoring, again, we can see this works really well. I'm not going to go into details. And then we have these interventions uh, targeted at these children, which are very interesting because actually we, the ministry had said quite clearly we do not want specific categories in this review. We want to look at it as more. But looking at inclusion research, you cannot get beyond these children. I'm sure you know them. Danish teachers know them very well, and children who have behavioral difficulties, or whatever you'd like to call them, are something that are very difficult for teachers to maintain in the classes. And one of the interesting interventions we found here, these were the self-regulative interventions. So this is how children learn um, to control their, all their impulses. So they have, for example, one where you have a little thing in your ear, and Danish teachers always become very happy. They usually I have one of these to, you know, switch my slides. And then they get this picture of this thing in the ear and then this, and they have an idea that they can give a buzz to those children. So they go, oh, and they stop. But that's not the idea of the <laughs> intervention. They really like it, and they're all happy about it afterwards. I said, no, 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 it's not torture. It's a little buzz in the ear the teacher can give every 15 minutes. And then the child stops and reflects on, what am I doing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to? How do I get back on track? And who can help me to do it? And gradually, as time moves on, these children become very good at containing themselves. Yeah, you're laughing. I can tell you the other story. My mother was an international expert, and she was in Uganda teaching uh, teachers down there. And one of them puts up a hand at a, at, at a time and says, Dr. Disagard, I would like to know. I'm very lucky. I have a stick, and it's very long, so I can even reach you. Yeah, and it's very effective. It works. And, and she was like, and she said, no, no, that's not the question. The question is, when I hit the students and if there comes a little bit of blood out of the ear, does that matter? <laughs> it does. So this is not what I'm promoting. Okay. So to give you another idea, this is uh, the Danish school reform. We've just had a new school reform in Denmark, um, which in my eyes is a very good reform, but we have quite a lot of problems with it right now. But we did for the ministry, this was about do looking for interventions that worked in six of the central areas of the reform. So we had well-being and educational environment, pedagogical management, reading literacy, mathematical literacy, varied teacher. This is very exciting. <laughs> I usually call this bonfire because it's about everything outdoors and indoors and on the ceiling and under the floor. And then we have the all-round development of children. So the ideas of this was that finding intervention so that the teacher could, could be inspired in how can I actually work with this and are these actually interventions where the research is confirming this is actually something that has worked for others. And you can see here in the mathematics, for example, we found five different themes where there are about 10 to 15 different interventions in you can be inspired by. So we had systematic problem solving, modeling, hands-on materials, ICT-supported learning, awareness about own competencies. And if we look at the very teaching, 
user-oriented practical teaching using technology, physical activities and learning, outdoor teaching, and a longer school day. So these are some of the things. And what really has disappointed me is we've made some really good publications, and I travel the country around, and the teachers are saying, we don't know how to do this because we aren't inspired. We don't know which interventions work. And this is one of the really big problems I have. How do I actually get the teachers to use this? So we know a lot of consultants are working with this, but how do we actually get back to the teachers? And this is just to give you a picture of what we're doing for the teachers so they don't have to. If we look at the mathematical uh, literacy um, mapping, you can see we have 19 randomized control trials included, 18 quasi-experimental, three systematic reviews where 80 stu uh, studies or references are represented, and one other. But I, for fun, just added up how many students were actually part of this research, 47,260. So this is quite solid evidence, um, which definitely can you be used to inspire others. And just to give you an example before you get your questions, this is, this is one of the ones I really like. But this is also one of the ones where I say this about evidence-informed teaching is a good thing because students would be very upset if I did this. This is um, an intervention called Carry a Tune, a song program constructed to help children with reading difficulties. So they have 30 minutes three times a week for nine weeks. And the teachers act as supervisors, and they continually evaluate the student's progress. Now, this is a very strange intervention, but I really like it. <laughs> and this were these are, um, I, I think they're 13 to 14 years old, these students. And the reading intervention goes out to that they choose one of their favorite songs, pop songs, I guess, mostly. And then they have to learn to sing the song. And they also have to learn how to read the text, but also doing the right tones and everything. Um, and I thought, that can't be true. That can't work. But it really does work. And this is an RCT study where 4,000 uh, students have participated. And look what happened. 30 minutes, three times a week, nine weeks, and improvement uh, equaling seven months of regular teaching. And the interesting thing about this is that the effect improves over time. Now again, this is not because I'm saying that you will have to go back in your English classes and start singing pop songs. <laughs> But it's a way to show you that there are a lot, there's a lot of inspiration to be found out there. And they're lying there, and uh, teachers can be inspired by it. Again, as I said, I will not do that towards the students, because I think they would become deaf quite quickly. So are there any questions, comments? Yes? Oh. Oh. Um, so earlier on, you, you mentioned uh, that one of the criticisms has been that because the people who often fund you is the government, that that, that can be a criticism. Um, but your argument was, well, we never know what we're going to find. To what extent are you free to publish that information regardless of what you find? Or do you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to agree to confidentiality before you can go ahead and do the study? I'm free to publish it all because we're doing research, so, so we own the data and we're allowed to publish it. Um, so the only, thing, the only thing the ministry decides on, for example, is when they want to go public. But, and then it's also different according to contracts. So sometimes we say, well, if you haven't done it within three months, then we'll do it on our own. Thank you. Uh, you were talking about uh, how to uh, get the research done actually to, to be implemented, so to say, in, in schools and change uh, activities there. Uh, and I was thinking about, uh, you have another organization, I, I don't really remember the name, is it EVA? Yes. Yeah. And uh, can you say something about how you work with them, if you work with them, and, and uh, what could be the... Uh, the different tasks, because I understand it, they work quite a lot with with the um, municipalities, for instance, to to uh, uh, in this field as well. Mm. 
Yes, it's true. Eva is the Danish Evaluation Institute, and um, they do evaluations. And it's an interesting question because the daycare review I was telling about the Scandinavian is something we've done for Eva. And uh, this has resulted in a database, which is actually something we can see has been used quite a lot um, by daycare institutions. So every year, we look at all the research from the Scandinavian countries, and, and practitioners can go in and look what works uh, there. So Eva is in many ways different from us because they're working direct. I mean, schools can order them or municipalities to do evaluations, but that would be too expensive to get us to do that, and that's not what we're actually doing. But we have that collaboration. Yes. Um, I'm a science teacher, so I'm actually wondering, do you have subject-specific research, or it's all about general, like you said, in inclusion in a anything? Or do you do something which, uh, like you said, mathematics? and reading, is there, uh, are you aware of any science, um, I don't know, um, ideas? It's an interesting question actually because on the uh, literature study we've just done on uh, intensive uh, teaching, we have quite a lot of the STEM studies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's quite a lot of research out there on that also. It's not something we've done, I would love to do it, I have actually uh, said to the ministry it could be a very good idea, but there's actually quite a lot of research there, and yes, we could. But if you're interested in finding them, you should look at the STEM studies because, th yes, STEM for science, technology, you know. Yes? <laughs> All right. So. As I say, there's a lot to be found, so good hunting. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. <laughs>